Hello, welcome fellow film buffs. I'm Zach Droll, and I'm joined by my co-host and fellow cinephile, Hunter Ventilero. What is going on, Zachy boy? Not much. We are the box office losers each and every week. We deep dive into the movie sphere to watch and review any and all things that ever grace the silver screen or your TV screen, depending on however you watch them. This week, we are talking about Kong Skull Island. Big monkey! But uh, before we get into that, um, Hunter, how was your week since we last spoke? Wow, wouldn't it make that very fluid and very yeah, like, fuck you. seamless? <laughs> fuck you. Uh, you know, I've been doing good. Been watching some stuff, getting prepped to watch Kong Skull Island. Just finished it like literally two seconds ago. Pretty good movie. Yeah. Excited to talk As you were it. setting up your uh, audio. Oh, yeah, for like 12 minutes because my fucking audio just had I got a new computer. Uh, last week, um, we did okay, but you said there's a little bit of wishy-washy this with my audio, so I tried to fix that, and now, hopefully this week, it is fixed. Right now, I'm not hearing myself in my ear, so that's a fucking plus. Last yeah. week, uh, not in this podcast, but on a different podcast, I kept hearing myself, so I was like, absolutely no, and then I was doing that for a little bit before, and then I finally got it to work. My audio's coming up here, I'm not picking you up, fingers crossed, it comes up. Fairly well when we do, uh, when we edit everything together. So yeah, just like if you like, um, I I can hear myself, but it's not like mm. a second later. It's like directly, yeah, like the the, the very moment I speak. Mm. I don't know if this is gonna work with uh, my other podcast that I do because the other one requires me to record all this the the tracks. <laughs> kind of like how I did it back in the yeah. day. So yeah, that's not a bad thing. It's just. Right now, it's it's, right now it's picking me up, and I'm not hearing myself, so I can, no, I can do Skype calls by myself, I just can't pick up anyone else's audio, so that means mm-hmm. I need to do more editing, I do not want to do that, yeah. but um, uh, my, the most recent episode of Andrew's Amazing Podcast that came out, we had a guest on named John Sanzone, and he does, his own, he does his own podcast, and he uses something called Zencaster, which you do have to pay for, but... If you do less than eight hours of audio a month, then you're able to use it for free. So I'm going to look more into that because one of my podcasts I do is bi-weekly. So we do only two episodes a month instead of four. So maybe that will be good for us because it records everyone's separate audio tracks and then you can bring it into Audacity and edit it all together. So I might be able to do that because if it just records them based off what uh, their microphones are using because their microphones are terrible. So, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to try, try that as a workaround, so fingers crossed yeah. on that one. What, what have, have you been, been up to, boy? You told um, me you got a VR headset. Yes, I got the Oculus Quest To, to watch, watch porn! <laughs> no, have not done that yet. No, oh, yeah, well, you just got it. <laughs> right? I got it, like, like, three, four days ago. I, it's fun, like, hey, I, I, mm-hmm. VR is a very fun thing. Yeah. I've I've been interested in VR ever since I read uh, the Ready Player One book, mm-hmm. and it, it's hey it, it's an experience and a half. I've been playing super hot Beat Saber VR yeah, chat. I was say definitely hop into Beat Saber. Beat Saber is one of the uh, better VR games. Mm. Well, also so is um so, so is Super Hot. Super Hot is, whoo. Yeah, I just played Super Hot not VR and it was real good. So Super Hot VR. Legit, like, I've been doing a lot of Matrix shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> been freaking dying how's the, a bunch. How's the space in your room going? You gotta have room for that shit. Um, not, like, you don't have, you don't, you don't need much room. Um, need the, Oculus. Well, the Oculus is a little bit better on how they do the dynamic um, yes. movements. Stuff like, um, oh God, what's the other, what's the other, um... You got the headset? HTC Vive. Yeah, the Vive and the PlayStation headset. Those ones require a little bit more of a distance you need. So. Oh no! Like with, with this one, like it lets you set up like your play area. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it, it makes you draw out um, a square on the floor. And I, I have a decent enough room, but I like um, I have like punched and stuff. So I have punched my dresser. Nice. A, a bunch. It hurts. I bet. But yeah, it's like it's interesting stuff, and I I, I recommend it to anybody who can. Um. Oh, and get get into it. I think it, it's a fairly cheap system. I think what I got it. So I had even some. If you want to play with your Steam stuff, you have to you have to get like an eighty dollar cable. Yeah, that's, that's a little ridiculous. ridiculous. But like, but like with the headset and the cable all together, it's like four hundred. 
hmm. which is not too bad for um, a, a now kind of top of the line headset. Yeah, yeah especially, especially with, with the, the Oculus, Oculus library or the, the VR, VR library being as big, bigger than it was yeah. prior. Back, Back in the day, there was like three games that looked like ass. Nowadays, you can get some good stuff. Yeah. So, so speaking of good stuff, let's move on to our movie for the week, Kong Skull Island. Zachy Boy, do you want to hit us up with that overview? Yeah. Kong Skull Island is a 2017 American sci-fi uh, monster film directed by Jordan Vorget Roberts, right? Vog- I think it's Vog- Vought. Vought Roberts. Um, it is a reboot of the King Kong franchise and serves as a second film in the Legendary Monsters verse. In the Legendary Monster verse, in 1973, a team of scientists and Vietnam War soldiers travel to the uncharted Skull Island and meet the mighty Kong, a gigantic ape who is the last of his species, closely followed by other terrifying creatures. Big monkey. That's what this movie is. Yeah, yeah this, this movie, movie is so goddamn good. You get to see a lot of what they want to do with a lot of the cool monster verse stuff. Like, Godzilla did have, you know, the Mutos and Godzilla himself, and it was cool to see, like, the little Mothra Easter egg and what they wanted to build. But this is kind of like the culmination. I wouldn't say culmination because we're getting Godzilla be Kong later, but this is, like, peak. Like, this is a lot of the monster bullshit we can do. We got Kong fighting a bunch of monsters this entire film, and the human element is surprisingly good as opposed to the Aaron Taylor Johnson and Brian Cranston stuff we got in the first Godzilla movie. Not that it was necessarily bad, it just wasn't good. Yeah, like, like um, th- th- this one, like, uh, a lot of the characters felt more grounded in reality, and you actually feel... A lot of their like emotional struggles yeah. in a way. The only thing I will knock for this movie is the just lazy deaths they do. They just go, that guy's oh, dead, that uh, guy's dead, that guy's dead. It's kind of annoying. It's kind of like shock factor. Like you think, oh, these people are gonna survive, and then all of a sudden they just randomly die for absolute. Like a monster comes out of nowhere and just kills them. Like the doctor, um, yeah. John Ortiz's character. He's just standing on the boat, and all of a sudden, bird swoop down and take him away and rip his arm off. And I'm like, <laughs> why? Or um, I forget uh, who was the one that was gonna sacrifice himself with say... the grenades, and he got like whipped into the fucking mountain. Yeah, and it just blows up. It's like, what the hell? Um, let me try to find. I think it's Corey Hawkins. No, Corey Hawkins is the black guy. Ignore me. Um, <laughs> I think. Uh... <sighs> That's Shane, Shane Wiggum. Yeah, uh, Shane Wiggum. He, he plays Glenn Mills. Mills. No, he plays uh, Earl Cole. And he is like, I'm going to sacrifice myself and blow this monster up. And he sits in front of the monster and just kicks him away and he blows up on a mountain. I was like, that's fucking stupid. And then Toby Hill. The monster's like, the monster's like I'm not going to eat you. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh. It saw, um, he saw uh, John the Goodman grenades. Getting, so, so he, he was like, like, oh, it's going to eat me, and then he gets kicked because they're a little bit smarter. But, like, yeah. let's face it, Toby Kebbell is in this movie for, like, 20 minutes, and he's not even, like, interacting with any of the characters, and he dies off screen, technically. Yeah, he dies off screen. Like, I'm sorry, but his, I have a funny thing with his death, kind of, and how it built up to it with the fucking stick bug. It's like, yo, dude, why are you shooting me? You were sitting on me, man. Yeah. Hey. Like, there's, There's just, like, a lot of weird, stupid deaths that are unnecessary. And Toby Kell is yeah. probably one of the biggest ones. Because, like, you get separated, so Samuel Jackson's like, we gotta go find him, plus there's explosives there. So we want to blow up Big Monkey. And Toby Kell is like, alright, I'm gonna just try to make it back to my boys. Everyone else is dead. He fights the stick bug, he beats it. And then he gets attacked by one of the skull crushers, or skull critters, whatever they're called. And I was like, in, when I first watched this movie, in my brain, I was like, oh... He's not dead. He died off screen. He's going to come back and it's going to reveal that, like, maybe he lost an arm or uh, maybe he killed the creature and got blood and guts all over it. And he'll be fine. He'll come back. And then all of a sudden the monster throws up his dog tags. And I'm like, he could still be dead. Maybe it attacked him and ripped his dog tags off, you know? And then it just the movie ends and he's like, he's just like, oh, he's dead. I'm like, what? Like, out of all the characters to die... They, they made him just die off screen. I was like, whatever. I guess, I guess that's revenge for a fan force. Well, see... Well, also, a, a lot of, um, 
a, a lot of like I, I thought a lot of like main character. I, I thought Earl died earlier because a lot of the soldiers look the same. To be honest, well, we're all wearing the same, same outfit. outfit. A, a, a lot of them, like 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 um Shane w- w- Wiggum has has the same face. Mm. As someone, I'm like, oh, okay, he died, and no one's gonna acknowledge it. Yeah, fucking cool. Yeah, it's but a lot um, of weird stuff. But, but speaking of, we keep talking about the cast members. I'm gonna delve into the cast. We got Tom Hiddleston as James Conrad. He is the Nathan Drake type character. He is a soldier who is still in Thailand, uh, Vietnam, looking for something to you know make him leave. There's a good line that um John Goodman says. He's like, seeing as you're, he's like, people come to a war to find something. Uh, seeing as you're still here, you haven't found it yet. I was like, that's really good. Like, that's what's well, cool like, um, thing. yeah, I if you notice, I took out a lot of the, the descriptions of people yeah, because we, we, we can do it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, we got Samuel L. Jackson as Preston Packard, he is the military leader of the group. He is a blowhard idiot who wants to blow up a monkey. Um, but by the way, might I add too for a PT 13 movie that's allowed one F bomb, they didn't give it to him because they're subverting expectations. <laughs> they gave it to well. We'll, we'll we'll get to him. He, he's at the very bottom of this Rack it for out. some reason. Because <laughs> he's technically um, not really the main character, I suppose. But then again, Toby Kelly will appear in the middle. Uh, we got John Goodman as William Randa. He is one of the monarch head uh, higher ups. We got Brie Larson as Mason Weaver. Mason's a girl. The last I checked, such a good line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's a photographer and she likes big monkey. Um, we have Jing Tian or Tian as San Lin. She is, um, I think she works at Monarch, or she is. She works with. Or she's um, one of the translators. She 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 works with the guy who played um, Doctor Dre and Trey Out Compton. Yeah, pretty much now. Um, I think that's Jay Mitchell or Corey Hawk is one of those two. I mix them up not because, because they're black, because I don't remember what they look like. Hey, I, I I was happy to see those two in here because I, I watched Shane Out of Compton like a like a year or two ago. Mm. It's a really good movie. You're like, look, look at them. them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I was I was like, wait, is that the person who played Easy E? And then it was like, okay, it was cool, cool. Then we have Toby, Toby Kebbell playing, playing Jack Chapman. Chapman. He is the second in command and dies off screen. Lame. We have John Ortiz as Victor Davis. He's one of the scientists for, I want to say Monarch, but it's not what he works for. I think he works for Langstat. I think that's uh, one of the military people. Um, he's the one who gets ripped apart by the birds. We then have Corey Hawkins playing Houston Brooks. I believe Brooks is... Let me just double check with the name. Um, yeah, Houston Brooks is... Houston, Houston, yeah, okay, okay I'm, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. right. Corey Hawkins, Hawkins is the doctor that works with Bill Randa, who okay. is um, going to head up Monarch. And I, I guess he's going to invite Gene Tomlin to do it. We then have uh, Jason Mitchell playing Glenn Mills. Glenn Mills is the black soldier who loves his mama. I love my mama. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have Shea Wiggum <laughs> as Captain Explosion, Earl Cole. He's the one who blows himself up. Uh, that's, that's a great description of him. We then have yeah. Thomas Mann as Rex Slipko. He's the young guy. And then we have Toby Kebbell and Terry Natari as King Kong's mocap. And then John C. Riley as Crazy Santa Claus Hank Marlowe. Well, hey, think about it. Uh, at least Toby Kebbell gets to do more than one thing in this movie. Yeah, he's got a big monkey. Big monkey. <laughs> You know, um, but yeah, so I guess so. John C. Riley gets the single f bomb in this, yeah. and it, it, it's not even a good use of the f bomb. Hold on, I, I have it quoted. I legit have it quoted. Um, where is it? Where is it? So um, it, it sounds like a bird, but it's a fucking ant. Oh yeah, that's, that's a, a really, really good line. line. That's um. Apparently, I found some trivia. Uh, apparently, I did find some trivia. Um, I found trivia talking about uh, that was actually an improvised line from John C. Riley. He was just trying to. Uh, the the director told him to start talking about monsters, and like John C. Riley was like, "Okay, I'm gonna make up like something crazy to try to make everybody laugh." And he goes, "It sounds like a bird, but it's an ant. It's a big fucking ant." And uh, the director actually wanted to try to get the flying giant ant in um, the movie, mm-hmm. but it wasn't able to do the budget constraints. Which I thought it was like, "Oh man, we are so close to greatness," but it is what it is. <laughs> Um, but speaking of budget, yeah. um, the, the budget of this film was, uh, 
185 so million. Surprisingly low for a monster movie. Yeah. And then the box office, Smash. it made five hundred and sixty-six point seven million dollars. Even if you double the budget due to marketing, this still beats it out. Not it box broke, office it, bomb. It, 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 it broke pretty much even at that yeah, point. If you like, a little bit more depending than depending on marketing, I think this also was marketed at the Super Bowl at the time. Might have been. And, and Super Bowl ads were like three million dollars. Yeah. Like per second, I think. Mm-hmm. So stupid. That's, that's why most Super Bowl commercials are really short. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the Reddit one that was like one second. Reddit, <laughs> get karma. <laughs> well, no, well, no, it was no, it, it was the Reddit one because of the stock market stuff, mm. and someone legit bought an ad, nice. and and it said, "Hey, fuck the economy." <laughs> Yeah, no, oh, that's dope. I actually have a Super Bowl commercial I want to pitch to Cheetos. I'll tell it to you after the podcast because it is absolutely stupid and it does not make sense in the context of Kong Skull Island. So I'll talk about it later. So, you know what? Fair enough. Let's, let's move, I'll accept that. Let's move on to our notes for the movie. We got a little bit. We got some stuff to talk about. Some cool stuff with some writing and some inspirations. So let's just head on straight into it. Kong Skull Island was originally just going to be called Skull Island, and it was announced by Legendary Pictures back in 2014 at San Diego Comic-Con. And uh, it was supposed to... They also announced at the same time they were doing the crossover, which we learned about in Godzilla. Uh, the script had some screenwriters attached before filming, seeking continuity between Kong and Godzilla. Max Borenstein, who wrote Godzilla in 2014, wrote the first draft, while John Gatins was hired to pen the second one. In writing the script, Bornstein did not want to repeat Beauty and the Beast plot that the other King Kong movies have done and took into account the outdated elements of the treatment of the island natives and the damsel in distress. His influence was actually Apocalypse Now. So That's pretty cool. Yeah, he said, what well, popped in my head for the paradigm of the movie was Apocalypse Now. That's obviously a war movie, but I like the idea of people moving upriver to face a misunderstood force that they think as a, that they think of as a villain Ultimately, they come to realize it is much more complicated. Big Monkey is gone on this island. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what John's right. king. Is, yeah. He is king. He's a very subtle king. Yeah. He just he protects, protects everybody because he's the last of a species because his parents got loitered. He big sad monkey. <laughs> Before um, Vought Roberts signed on as director, Bornstein thought of having the film being begin during the Vietnam War and jump forward to the present day. After Legendary rejected it, Bornstein instead had the film take place before the original King Kong film in 1917 during World War I, while keeping the Apocalypse Now concept. The premise had Tom Hiddleston's character leading a rescue team to Skull Island to find his missing brother, who got stranded there while searching for a Titan Sermon? Sermon? Serum. Serum. Sorry. Um, believed to cure all illnesses after this porn scene again uh, retooled the story to take place in the present day. They were like, no, stop, stop doing that. <laughs> hey, I- I'm happy they took away the dancel and the stress stuff. Though. Yeah, that's, all, uh, that's a big happy. reason why um, Brie Larson actually took up the role as Mason Weaver because they said, uh, she said that she's more of an action girl, Mason Weaver, instead of being a dancel and stress. So that's why she took it on. That's cool. So... After Boy Roberts joined the project, he met with Bornstein. Like the Apocalypse Now concept, Roberts pitched it to Legendary with taking the story uh, the end of Vietnam, which the studio finally accepted. It was later revealed that Dan Gilroy had also collaborated on the drafts. And then in 2015, Derek Connolly also did some rewrites. Bornstein worked on a final pass in the screenplay. I'm glad they still kept Bornstein around. Before shooting began, and uh, credited his script to all writers, saying it was definitely collaborative in terms of what's on the screen though none of us work together. There are pieces of my work in there, as well as work of the other two writers and John Gatons, who was credited for story. Everybody really had a good hand in it. Which I like that stuff. I like it when, instead of like what happened with the Die Hard movie, where this guy goes, I'm going to adapt the book and then, write a, and then write a movie. And they go, okay, no. And they fire him. And then barely credit him. It's cool that they were like, okay, even though the draft got a million rewrites, they still incorporated a lot of stuff from everybody, and everyone's hands were still in the pot. So I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, you should pick up that final sentence. Uh, Gilroy oh, revealed. Yeah. Uh, Gilroy, Gilroy revealed that many backstories 
and character moments were dropped from his draft, specifically for Mason Weaver and James Conrad's characters, which are uh, Larson and Hiddleston, uh, feeling that they had room, feeling that the film had more room to explore them. Gilroy disclosed Brie Larson's character, Mason Weaver, was somebody who was really war weary and had taken photographs for far too long. She didn't believe in anything, so the first time she saw Kong, it was like an awakening. She comes essentially back to life. Uh, Tom, Tom Middleton's character, James Conrad, was a guy whose unit had been attacked by a big monster out of Vietnam, so he was in search of this thing. Instead of them approaching him at a bar and giving him a job, I had him uh, say that he wanted to be on board. He said, I like the characters a lot, but they didn't want to go with that. Because they basically wanted Conrad to go, something destroyed my unit, I want to go and find it. Which is kind of what yeah. they retooled Samuel Jackson's character to be. Yeah. A little bit later on. And then they made James uh, Conrad, Tom Middleton's character, mostly kind of like the action man. There's a scene where they're fighting in um, the boneyard and he puts the, the mask on and just samurai swords the shit out of all these flying guys to save Slipkov. I was like, what the fuck is this man's on? <laughs> Going ham. Listen, I, I, I swear, he, he should have been casted for for, for Nathan Drake. Oh, yeah, I, 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 I like... I um I like Tom Holland. The only reason why Tom Holland has a lot of potential being Nathan Drake is because they can make him into they can make this into a franchise as the person we did as well. Because Tom Holland is old enough to play an adult because he's my age, and but he looks young enough to play young Nathan Drake. What we're gonna get is young Nathan Drake with a younger Sully, and then as the years go on, if let's fingers crossed, Tom Holland's baby face gets a little bit more mature, we can see him play Nathan Drake for four or five movies. So, said I, we'll and Kyle, e- even if you want to like the Nathan Drake's brother, just put oh, Hiddleston in there. Oh, that would be great. Sam is uh, older than Nathan, and Tom Hiddleston obviously it, it, older. It, 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 work. it works. Yeah. Like I, I think that, that this film helps show that he can be like that type of character. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, for sure. Especially, Especially with the outfit they gave him. They knew what they were doing. doing. Yeah, he's legit, legit wearing one of the outfits, outfits from I think Uncharted Two. Just like there he is. Mm-hmm. So despite the ideas for those characters being dropped, Gilroy felt the film turned out to be a good movie anyway. He said in April 2016, artist Joe DeVito sued producers for the movie using elements of the Skull Island universe, which he claimed he created to the producers without his permission. Oh, shut the, shut the fuck up. Yeah. This guy was like, they copied my shit. And they were like, yo. Uh, director um, of what Roberts stated that he wanted Kong to look iconic and straightforward. Um, enough that a third grader could draw him. Baby monkey. <laughs> and, and the image would still be just uh, still be recognizable. Uh-huh. Uh, but Roberts also wanted uh, Kong to feel like a a lonely god. He was a more uh, a, a Monroe's figure, Morose. lump morose figure, lumbering around the island. Yeah. And took the design back to the 1933 incarnation. Uh, I- I- yeah, incarnation. Uh, fuck. Uh, uh, t- yes, that word, incarnation. Thank you. I am not old here today, as I always am. Still trapped in the VR world. Come back yes. to the Oasis, Zach. We need you. <laughs> which presented Kong as a, a biblical. Bipedal. No. Oh <laughs> my <laughs> god. <laughs> Big monkey stand on two legs. <laughs> a bipedal creature that walks in an upright position. Uh, what Roberts additionally stated, if anything, our Kong is meant to be a throwback to the 33 version. Um, Kong was a movie monster, so we worked really hard to take some of the elements of the 33 version, some of those exaggerated features, some of the cartoonish, iconic qualities... And then make their own. Uh, we created something that has some degree served as a throwback to the inspiration from what uh, started all of this. But also um, had it fully be unique and different creature that I would like to think is a fully contained and identifiable as a 2017 version of King Kong. King Kong. I think we are very modern elements of him. Yet, hopefully, he feels very timeless at the same time. Yeah, he's just a big monkey. And he looks like a big monkey, so it works. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I still personally like the um, 
the the Peter Jackson version of King Kong. I've actually never seen that movie, but I heard it's really long and it's kind of boring, so I was like, I'll watch the action movie things. It's it, it's good. It's because it it t- it's pretty much like the 1917 version of King Kong, but just with Jack Black. Yeah, it's like a movie director being an asshole. Yeah. So, um, where were we? Uh, so uh, Hayao. Yeah. Hayao Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke helped influence the monster's design and approach. Robert stated Miyazaki's Mononoke was actually a big reference in a way that the spirit of the creatures sort of had their own domains and fit within that. So a big thing was trying to design creatures that felt realistic and could exist in an ecosystem that feels sort of wild and out there. And then also design things that simultaneously felt beautiful and horrifying at the same time. Like a fucking ant. Giant fucking ant. <laughs> Uh, the the two armed pit lizard, lizard from the 1933 King Kong film was used as a reference for the skull crawlers. They were also ins- that's why I looked familiar. Yeah. I'm, I'm reading the final sentence now. They also inspired by a number of other monster movies and the cinematic uh, creatures. Uh, Robert said the creature, beyond being a reference to the creature from the 1933 film, was also a crazy fusion of all the influences throughout my life, like the first angel from Evangelion and No Face from Spirited Away, and even Cubone from Pokemon. And speaking of anime, in January 2021, Netflix and Legendary Television announced plans for an anime-style series set in the MonsterVerse. It follows the adventures of a shipwreck, a shipwreck characters that are trying to escape from the titular Skull Island, home to prehistoric monsters. Brian Duffield will write and executive produce the anime series alongside Jacob Robinson, who will executive produce under his company, Tractor Pants, great name. Uh, the series will be animated by Powerhouse Animation. I'm going to look up what Powerhouse Animation did. I don't know. I but, um, yeah, th- th- that's why... Except I was looking at the freaking skull, like, the skull monster. I'm like, this looks so familiar for some reason. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I know the Evangelion, because I watched that whole entire series mm-hmm. with my friends. Yeah, g- g- Q-Bone is obvious. I don't think I've seen Spirit of the Way. Oh, dude, the guys who, um... Do the pa- powerhouse animation, animation of the guys who do the Castlevania anime on Netflix. Ooh, I had that space. So that movie's gonna be fucking. So that's gonna be fucking clean. They also do Blood of Zeus and the new He-Man um, one done by Kevin Smith, which is coming out later this year. So yeah, that that anime is gonna be fucking clean. And last but not least, for our little bit of movie news. Uh, not movie news, I would say movie uh, notes. Notes. Uh, Legendary Pictures obviously announced Kong Skull Island and... Not Kong Skull Island, oh my god. Godzilla and Kong having Godzilla and King Kong appear in the film together. It you know, was announced back in 2015, but you know, nothing happened. Uh, director Val Roberts had expressed interest in doing a film about Marlowe and Junpei's time on the island, but that was kind of more brought to the novelization. Uh, stating, I keep joking that personally I'd be more interested in doing a $30 million version of Young John C. Riley on Island, just some weird oddball monster comedy with him and Junpei. Um, <laughs> which I would love to see. Give it to me. Uh, but Godzilla Kong is scheduled to release March 24th, 2021, which is next to next Wednesday? Uh, hold on. I can pull up my calendar on my, on my computer. Yeah. Yeah, which is next week. Yep, and then we'll, we'll be covering Kong Skull Island next week, and the week after that, we'll give you guys enough time to watch the movie so that you guys will not be spoiled too much on Kong, uh, Godzilla vs. Kong. So, yeah, yay, I, the spoiler limit on movies is, is a week to two weeks, yeah, depending, it, on how, depending on how popular it is. Yeah. The Marvel movies fall under that two-week category, yeah, though. Yeah, so we'll give you time to watch uh, yes. Godzilla vs. Kong before we talk about it. But... That is it for the notes. Now we're on to the plot. Yes. In 1944, two World War II fighter pilots, American pilot uh, Hawk Marlow and Japanese pilot uh, Gunpai uh, Kiri. What? Kiri? Kari? Yeah. Uh, parachute onto an island in the South Pacific after a dogfight and engage in close combat until the fight is interrupted by a giant 100-foot ape, big monkey. Big monkey. In 1973, Bill Ron, uh, R- Ronda yeah, yeah. heard of the U.S. government organization Monarch plans a search for a uh, primival, right? Yeah. Primival? Yes. Okay. I just want, I just want confirmation. I want something stupid. Creatures on the recent... Uh, uh, on the recent discovered Skull Island, he recruits a U.S. Army unit uh, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Preston Picard. 
uh, tractor, uh, tracker and former British Specialist Air Service Captain James uh, Conrad and anti-war photographer Mason Weaver. Arriving at Skull Island, Picard's men become uh, begin dropping uh, semi, ah, seismic. seismic, thank you, explosions uh, developed by Rhonda's seismologist. Uh, seismologist. Thank you, Houston Brooks, to map out the island and prove Brooks' uh, hollow earth theory. The unit is then attacked by the giant ape, uh, scattering the survivors across the island. Two groups formed between the survivors, one with Conrad Weaver and the researchers, and one of the soldiers on the other with Rhonda and the rest. Picard searches for the uh, transport copter pilot um, by Major Jack Chapman, um, intended to use the weapons on board to kill the ape. Yeah, dude, this is like, this is a huge-ass opening. Uh, and it, it covers, covers a lot of the stuff that we're uh, okay. going to talk about real quick. But, dude, I'm gonna... you introduce you to the great characters. You get cool um, dialogue back and forth between a lot of these guys. And then we get the first sighting of Big Monkey. I, I To be honest, I thought I was going into a comedy first when I see a man fall from the sky. It seems like a comedy for a second. Oh, yeah. It's like, huh? But, yeah. Um, There's a bunch, bunch of comedy, comedy moments in there. There's um that, that one scene where the guy falls out of the helicopter into Kong's mouth, mouth, then it cuts to that one guy eating a sandwich. I thought that was funny. Yes, hilarious. yes. Beautiful transition. <laughs> I was like, like that's directing right there. That's what's um, up. <laughs> but also, I, I I love our intro to um James Conrad when he's fighting in a bar. It's just oh, yeah, amazing. He's, he's like, playing pool and he's hustling. And then they start attacking him and he beats the shit out of him. Yeah, he, he th- doesn't he like baseball like hit w- one of them in the throat I, with I, the yeah I think so I think he, he smacks, smacks someone in the mouth and then he hits someone in the throat with it I was, I was like Jesus Christ. Christ yep all right read up the yeah. next sentence so, paragraph because I'm stupid after the groups are separated uh, Conrad group encounters the local Emi natives and an older Hank Marlow Marlow tells the group about Big Monkey named Kong he protects the island from predators including a race of subterranean reptilian creatures he dubs. Skull crawlers, responsible for killing Big Monkey's entire species, leaving him the last of his kind. I'm just gonna call him fucking Big Monkey now. <laughs> Big Monkey, Ooh. Big Monkey Skull Island. Uh, the Ewe believe when Big Monkey dies, a giant skull crawler will awaken and ravage the island. Marlo reveals he and uh, Akari had become friends during their time on the island, but Akari was killed by a skull crawler some time ago. As Chapman is ambushed and devoured by a skull crawler, bitch move. Uh, Conrad group helps Marlow finish a boat made of parts from Marlow and Akari's down planes. They ride down the river, losing a man to carnivorous birds, also a bitch move, and secure communication with Packer's group because they're uh, trying to go get bombs. Um, when they regroup with Packer, he insists on searching for Chapman, who is revealed to be dead. Marlow leads them through a mass grave of dinosaurs, including Big Monkey's family members. The skull, the skull crawler that killed Chapman attacks them, killing Rhonda, uh, not Rhonda, Randa, and others before Weaver Rhonda. triggers a flammable gas explosion that kills it. Uh, learning of Chapman's death, Packard reveals his plans to kill Big Monkey and avenge his fallen men. Marlowe and Brooks attempt to explain that killing Big Monkey would lead to the skull crawlers running rampant, but Packard refuses to listen because he's angry. Uh, the groups part ways with Packard Drew retrieving the weapon from Chapman's chopper and laying a trap for Big Monkey at a nearby lake while the non-military personnel head back to the boat. Conrad and Weaver meet Big Monkey up close and seeing his true peaceful nature resolve to save him because, you know, save Big Monkey. Uh, Packard Drew lures Big Monkey with the, room, with the remaining seismic charges and incapacitates him with an ignited napalm. Conrad, Weaver, and Marlo arrive, and after the standoff, persuade the other soldiers to spare Big Monkey, but Packard refuses to yield. As the others retreat, the giant skull crawler emerges from the lake, and Kong crushes Packard. Uh, the skull crawler fights and overpowers Kong, but in the end, the Big Monkey is victorious with the human's help. The survivors reach the rendezvous point and leave Skull Island, and Big Monkey stoically watches as they leave. And end credits just pulled up to uh, Godzilla yeah. fighting the fight the rest of them. So, end credits yeah. scene, Marlowe reunites with his family and meets his son, who's played by the actor who played young Marlowe, which is really cool. 
for the first time. Uh, Monarch detain and then we get to see Monarch detain and recruit Conrad and Weaver. Sandlin and Brooks inform that Big Monkey is not the only Monster King to, arri- to, sh- <laughs> to arrive in you know the world's view and show archive footage of cave paintings depicting Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, and King Ghidorah. The final image shows Godzilla and Ghidorah in battle, which is what Godzilla, King of the Monsters, is all about. And then we get Big Monkey. I cannot wait for Big Monkey to fight Giant Lizard. Yeah. And just freaking, like, and, and, and use his big magic stick. The big magic stick he has is actually one of Godzilla's scales. Oof. It's a big metal thing that um he puts one of Godzilla's scales into to make an axe. Big, big monkey new weapon. <laughs> I I I I like this movie a lot. Cause I, I I like some of the stupid shit that, that, that that's in this movie. Oh, there's, there's a lot of stupid, stupid shit in this movie, movie but in a good way. It, it, it some of it just makes me laugh. <laughs> it, I think every movie, depending on the type of genre, every I would say every action movie should have some moments of comedical levity to it. I'm not saying maybe mm-hmm. three billboards have comedy, it did have comedy in it, but a movie like three billboards shouldn't have too much comedy in it. It's good to have some levity, but you don't need a lot of it. Oh, like, no, like, the th- three billboards, like, it has, like, it doesn't have comedy. It has good one line. Exactly. That's still a part of it. You know, that's still comedy. But it, it, it's comedy, but, like, a, a lot of people can just, like, overlook that exactly. and not see that's comedy. But then if you watch an action movie, besides one liners that are typical in the 80s movies, it's always good to have some comedic aspect to good movies. Look at all the MCU movies. They're all action movies, except for, like, fucking Ant Man. But everything. And Guardians. Eh, I think Guardians 1 is an action movie. Guardians 2 is a little not. But, um, it's just cool to see that they subvert a little bit of the expectations with. Being big monkey movie, they go, here's some funny stuff. And here's some good comedic directing with Sandwich Bite. I thought that was absolutely hilarious. Well, it's like, that's also not the first time that we saw a good transition in a movie. We, that be, Going back to 500 Days of Summer, uh, a title card to that is, is above. Um, when he was happy in the elevator, and then the elevator opens back up and he's depressed. Mm-hmm. We, we, we've seen good transitions in movies, mm-hmm. and th- that, that's a good one as well. Yeah. All right, that is all the plot we are getting for now. So all right. I'm going to move on to Hunter, hit, hit us with this pitiful, p- pitiful, pitiful movie notes. I've already seen this movie, so a lot of the shock factor was gone. So I said I haven't seen this movie since the first time viewing it in theaters, but it has lost a lot of the shock factor and visual appeal. I still love this film. Larson is great, and the origins of Monarch, not really the origins, but you know what I mean, and the origins of Monarch are still good. Zach, what are your mid-movie notes? That's all I got this week. Uh, for starters, at least this one is on HBO Max. Same with, King, uh, same with Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Um, and I, I, I said certainly, but I thought I clicked on a comedy when I saw Home Talk fall from the sky. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just, bah! and then it cuts to the plane crash, and I'm like, what am I watching? <laughs> then, mon- monkey hand. Um, th- this scene aged like milk when Goodman says... This is, um, says, this is going to be the worst time in D.C. And that's when they were protesting the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. Uh, if only, if only they knew. If only they knew 30 years later. Um, and there is nothing like 1970s war, war music. Mm-hmm. Love it. I love, um, I love all that type of shit. Cause it, it, it's, it, it's good. Hey, it's good music. Um, being that my introduction to Goodman was Monsters, Inc., I can only see Sully whenever I hear him speak. He's also Pacha. Then, I know, but, like, m- my introduction first was Monsters, Inc. Yeah. Yours was, of course, Pacha of Emperor's yeah. New Groove. I mean, oh, of course I watched Monsters, Inc., but I started recognizing actors more so when I first watched Emperor's New Groove because I was like, Dave Spade. I was like, Patrick Warburton. I was like, John Goodman. I'm like, I know these guys. They've done stuff. Um... Fucking love Tom Hiddleston in any scene of any movie. He owns the room. Oh, he's great. He's a really good actor. He he, he pretty much stuff. like he 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 has a very commanding presence. I'm excited to see Loki, the TV show, because I haven't seen him in a TV show in forever. He did one I think called Is it I Am the Night or is it Night Manager or I, I don't know. Yeah, he played like a evil. He was evil. He played like a spy who was trying to infiltrate um, House from Houses. House, house from the show House. <laughs> 
Um, the the doctor, doctor show? Yes, the guy who played the dad from Stuart Little. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. He was trying to infiltrate his, like, like evil organization of gang stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Um... So, I'm not a fully fan of Brie Larson's acting, because I think cause my, my first intro that I fully got to see her act was uh, Captain Marvel, in a way. Really? Wow. My, my first, first introduction, introduction to Brie Larson, Larson was um, Room, with, uh, that was the one that she won an Academy Award for, or mm. it was his nominee. She won something. It was, it was Academy Award, so Globe, something. something, or an Oscar, and then so she popped up in Community when I finally watched it for the first time. She was in that first, obviously, but then I saw it. I was like, oh, it's Brie Larson. And then she was in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World as Envy. Well, yeah, outside of Scott Pilgrim, because she didn't much have, like, a giant role there yeah, so good, in a way where I can see her acting at full potential. Like, yeah. of course, me with it being my first introduction to her in a leading role was Captain Marvel, so you can see why it leaves a little bit of a bad taste in the mouth. Well, to be fair, Captain Marvel was a little bit poo-poo. Yeah, so, I, I, so my, my note for this is, let's see if this movie changes my view on Brie Larson's acting. You did it. Kind of, not fully, but I can. But she's, she's. I, I, I can say she's a good. I actor. think you should watch Room. Mm-hmm. Not the Room. Room. <laughs> we'll get to the Room. That's, That's gonna, gonna be our like fucking hundredth episode, episode special. <laughs> I, I will say this though, Brie Larson and uh and Samuel Jackson have good chemistry. Oh yeah, yeah. we see. Like, like the even though they, they, black, they uh, even though they, they interacted very Captain little Marvel. here, yeah, they, they have good, they have good chemistry. Yeah, best part of Captain Marvel, right there. Um, I do like the touch of showing the the brotherhood w- 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 with the soldiers here. Oh, at the beginning, because um, when they're doing random shit. Yeah, like, cause like, cause you don't get to see that in war type movies. Uh, you yes just see no. depending on the war movie. Like, well, you, you, it, even if you see it, it's more or less in the background. Yeah. You don't get to see it front and center. Yeah, like, like this. There's that scene where um, uh, Corey Hawkins' character shows up. And not Corey Hawkins, uh, Mitchell. And he's talking to Toby Kebbell, and he's like, uh, "Dear son, sorry I missed your birthday. I'm the worst dad ever." <laughs> and he goes, "Sorry, Mr. Birthday. I-, I lied straight to your face. <laughs> Is that too short?" <laughs> like, because like, because you don't so get good. to see the, that that type of brotherhood with soldiers in most kind of Vietnam type movies. Well, most of that is just kind of like everyone's depressed and sad and angry. Yeah. And then Black Sabbath for the win. Always. <laughs> um, fucking yeeted a tree into them. He was like, bye bye. <laughs> he was like, Kong was like, huh? Spear. Yeah. Um, already liking this more than Godzilla. Oh. And this is my favorite shot in the entire movie. Oh, dude. This is With a the good sunset. Shot for sure, but my the, favorite the, shot I'll talk about later. The, 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 the sunset, the choppers, and Kong. Oh, even though like Kong, big monkey is CGI and everything is CGI there. Oh, beautiful scene. And also then when that guy goes, is that a monkey? Nah, dude, it's just 10 guys stacked on top of each other. (laughs) Yeah, Lola. Yeah. Uh, Seeing Hiddleston here, um, he too would have made a great Nathan Drake, as we said, to no extent here. Uh, John C. Riley, just, just, yeah, yeah, that's all I put down yeah, for that before one. Before we continue with the notes, I want to talk about my favorite scene in the movie. Uh, I was going to mm-hmm. do something with my dog, started fucking barking at someone. Um, my favorite scene in the movie is, uh, my favorite scene, my favorite shot is where, uh, Tom Hiddleston and Brie Larson meet Monkey face to face, and it's like, in that fog, and all of a sudden, Kong just kind of emerges from it. Oh, it's just mm-hmm. such a good, it's such a good yes. shot. And then, I might use this pickup line. It's the pickup line that John C. Riley says to Brie Larson. He does not use it on Brie Larson. He uses it on the entire group of people. But I feel like it was more direct towards Brie it Larson. Wasn't for sure. <laughs> uh, you are more beautiful than a hot dog and a beer at Wrigley Field on opening day. Well, you can use that, but it's not going to get you ladies, my man. <laughs> you don't know that. Uh, I do. It's not Kong. <laughs> Kong looking zooted. Big monkey, big buff monkey. The, 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 this is when he was fighting the fucking octopus. <laughs> I was like, God damn. Mm-hmm. Cause like, cause he, he was walking, stanced up, sat down on the water, drank, and then giant octopus was like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. 
Um, uh, then this is when Jack Chapman was sitting on the bug, and the bug's like, yo, dude, why the fuck are you shooting me? You sat on me. <laughs> it's facts. Um, it sounds like a bird, but it's a fucking ant. That's great. They gave the one F-bomb to John C. Riley, but not Samuel L. Jackson. Subverting expectations. I know, long. but still, like, in, uh, seeing him in PG-13 movies and not and him not getting the one F-bomb mm. kind of m- m- makes me sad a bit. Yeah, it is what it is. Um, and then th- this was before um, uh, Kong, uh, b- 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 before some of them were, were helping Kong. Before the team up. Yeah, um, I'm wondering how is Kong supposed to trust humans after this shit. He really um, does. This is for the wrestling fans. Uh, for, for the wrestling fans, Kong with the fucking axe hand off the top rope. <laughs> this is when he jumped and hit the um, skull crawler with the rock. <laughs> um, I like the subtle. And this is towards the end when he was in the chains, kind of underneath the boat. He goes, I like this is. I like the subtle nod to the OG Kong movies. Mm. With him being in chains in New York. Yeah. All right, that ends our mid movie notes <laughs> section. Now we're moving on to our reviews. So, yes. <clears throat> on Rotten Tomatoes, the film has an approval rating score of seventy five percent, with an average rating of six point five out of ten. The site's critical consensus reads: Offering an exhilarating eye candy, solid acting, and fast paced story, Kong Skull Island earns its spot in the movie monster mythos without even without ever matching up. To the original classic film, and for the first time in a couple of movies, I've had I have a higher review than you. Barely. I have a good review. You just barely. Yeah, Damon Fudge. Yeah, Damon Fudge of KCCI. Uh, Kong Skull Island is a magnificent and impressive giant monster epic that also feels very small and personal at the same time. And that's a good thing. Um, this bad review, like I said, I always try to find the harshest reviews mm. possible, so. Here you go. Yeah, so, so the, the bad, bad review, review, even though I gave it like one point lower than you, uh, <laughs> from jo- Jason Bailey of Flavorwire. Uh, I've got no quarrel with good, goofy monster movie. I'm the guy who liked The Great Wall. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're saying you liked The Great Wall and you're giving Kong Skull Island a bad review? Jason Bailey, you're fired. Great Wall was Matt Damon in a Chinese movie fighting dragons or some shit. It was so bad. No, was it Matt Damon? I said, I, I, I find the worst ones. But the, that film at least felt bound by a singular vision. What? By a director and his personality. Kong Skull Island is spare parts held together with scotch tape. Who is this man? Zach, you got the absolute worst review, not because they gave it a bad score, but because they don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Oh my god. I see what. So when I, I didn't read this fully, I just saw held together with scotch tape, and I was like, that's it. The only stuff I didn't like about this movie was the deaths, but it is what it is. So, I gave the movie eight big monkey out of ten. I don't know why you didn't take the easy way out, but it is what it is. Um, no, I, 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 I wanted to have fun with my, um, my thing. Yeah, so, I'm giving it my. My rating explained is, uh, during my first view of the film in theaters, I loved it and it still holds up. I love this film for the fact that it isn't just a big monster smash movie. It is all, it has better human elements than Godzilla and it subverts expectations enough, just like Rogue One did for the Star Wars franchise. It's just so good. This movie's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I gave this nine Loki going to square up a Kong, but in the end saves him from Nick Fury out of ten. <laughs> nice. Um... Uh, now the reason for this one, like I said last week, um, I, I I like this more than Godzilla. Uh, Kong has a soft spot in my heart. Also, this movie is paced so much better than Godzilla, far better. Yeah. On top of that, um, it makes me wanting more. Mm-hmm. I now cannot wait for Kong uh, versus Godzilla. I hope Kong makes Godzilla eat some monkey cheeks. <laughs> We're just gonna get a hardcore ass eating scene. <laughs> Atomic <laughs> breath around your asshole. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and the shit I said last week was stupid. Um, the thing you said last week was absolutely inappropriate and um absolutely uncalled for. This was funny. <laughs> no, the thing I said last week made me laugh so hard during editing. Oh, Jabuto's got a big pussy, yo. <laughs> Fuck you. 
<laughs> Listen no, to we all got a big bussy, big honky. <laughs> We didn't see anything on this one. All we saw was them ass cheeks, and Kong oh, got them cheeks, dude. Big monkey cheeks. <laughs> Clap it. All right, Zach, take <laughs> us out. Yes, thank you guys for listening, watching, whatever it is you're doing. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at Box Office Loser and on Twitter at Box Office Loser. For up to date news, posts, all that other shit, for me to. Do my contractually obligated tweets about this podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on wherever you're listening to this in the podcast first. Subscribe on YouTube. Leave a review on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever. It helps us get in the algorithm and puts us up there. Because we we like this stuff. But also, we want to at least be in the eye of the public. Because we are in the eye of one person, but he's been extras in movies. And we're happy for him. <laughs> Glenn Howard. Glenn Howard, what's up? <laughs> yeah. Galen Howard, we love you. Um, and share with your friends, do whatever you can to help us. Uh, Hunter, where can they find you? You can find me on the internet at Scruffy Moose Man. You can find me every other Tuesday at Pound That Butt, the gaming podcast. You can find me every Wednesday at Andrew's Amazing Podcast, a comic book podcast I do through the store I work at. You can find me every Thursday at Farthest Galaxy, the Star Wars podcast. And obviously, you can find me here at Box Office Losers. I do too much. Zach, Zach, where can we find you on the internet? You can find me at Dark Shadow Zake literally everywhere. Probably like wherever you can find th- that name, I'm there. Uh, you can find me every single week on the AEW Injection on the Sports Hit List. You can also find me every week here because, well, this is the only other podcast I work for. Yes, for now. And, uh, yeah, we will catch you guys next week for, uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters. Hell yeah, dude. And hopefully it's a lot better than the first Godzilla. If not, I'm going to be very upset. I hear it is, but, you know, I haven't seen it yet, so we'll get there. All right, guys. Oh, so, okay, so this will be both, this will be our first time viewing for both of us. It'll be first time, so we're going to have some genuine reactions from me in the mid-movie notes. I cannot wait. To talk about yes. big lizard fight big dragon and big moth. But all right, folks, we will catch you all next time. All right, peace. Goodbye. You are more beautiful than a hot dog and a beer at Wrigley Field on opening day.